This first panel, we will be approaching the meanings in plural of underground memory testimony and deposit of life and collective story. We will go into the history of Barcelona and the defense of its citizens through the building of underground air raid shelters, an idea that was exported to Europe afterwards, and we will have testimonies from Paris and Berlin. We will claim memory as a starting point to have a critical understanding of the present and face the future, and in order to do so, we will now introduce our speakers of the first panel of today. Milan Gebel is curator of the Berlin Story Bunker, specialist in society, politics and war. He studied law. He was director of the International Resistance of the World, an anti-military organization and a pacifist organization that had 10,000 members in Germany. In 2010, he opened his own uh, bookstore, the Berlin, so his own exhibit, the Berlin Story, and he organized the annual festival with more than 90,000 visitors. Since 2016, he is in charge of the archive of the Berlin Story Bunker. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, Carmen Miró has a PhD in ancient history and archaeology by the University of Barcelona. Since the year 89, she works at the archaeology service at the Culture Institute of Barcelona, and her research focuses on the archaeology of conflict, especially the footprints of the civil war in Barcelona. And he led the Barcelona project to bring back uh, information from the Roman era in Barcelona. Jill Thomas is an expert in the underground of the Town Council of Paris. He was member of the his local historic society studying the subsoil remains in medieval remains in Provence. In Paris, he discovered the underground quarries of the French capital. He co-edited Atlas of underground Paris, and he published 12 more books and about 300 scientific papers, among those some on Second World War shelters. He received several awards in recognition for his work. Nice to meet you, and thank you for being here. Um, and finally, Ana Laura Bertero, architect and author of Galerías del Tiempo, Galleries of Time, a um, path through every shelters of the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona. She is a double specialty master in history and culture and a master in architectural rehabilitation. She currently collaborates with the architectural firm Yansai Funalosa, specializing in conservation and catalog buildings as heritage in Tarragona. Welcome all. We will start with an initial presentation of about 20 minutes of each of our speakers, and then we will open the debate uh, to the public so that everyone can participate. So we will start with Vilan Gibel. If that's OK with you. Is it, yeah, okay. My name is Wieland Giebel, and I'm talking for Berlin Story Bunker. And uh, it should work here. Okay. You, yeah. No, but I should, it should work here. It would, be would be better. So, you see Berlin Story Bunker in red. This is a bunker um, built in... And be on the side, here over there, is the Anhalter Bunker, is a train station destroyed in 1900, here destroyed in 1945, and um, this was Hitler's train station. And in, in yellow, you see the Hitler's government center, and in green is um, the Reichstag, the government, the parliament building, and very small in, in the green um, is Brandenburg Gate. So you see that this bunker, Anhalter Bunker, Berlin Story Bunker, is really in the center of... Uh, this should work. Do you know how that works? I can no. um, okay. Um, I'll do that then, because faster. So, the bunker in the year 1933, when Hitler came to power. 
And uh, Hitler used this bunker always if he has had visitors or if he went to Munich, to Rome, or wherever. So the first bombers, as uh, Keyes told us before, came to Germany, to Berlin, in the year 1940. The, the British were the first to hit back. And um, this was not what we expected, because we planned to have the war in other countries, not not in Germany, not in Berlin. So Berliners were completely surprised that British bombers came and throw bombs on Berlin. So we have not had any bunker for civilians and no bunker for the Führer, for Hitler. The bunker, this bunker, Berlin Story bunker was built in the year 1942. And as you see on, on the right hand side is Anhalter Bahnhof, Hitler's train station, and you see that the wall of the bunkers are two meters. The bunker was built by slave workers from East Europe. Um, we do not know how many they were. And the bunker was ready in the year 1942, but people could not yet move in because it was not yet furnished. You remember the photos Keith has shown from, from Hamburg with banks, wooden banks in the bunker. This existed here too for a certain time, but then later the banks were stolen or sold because people needed wood for burning for, for at home. So in the years from 1944 on, people had to stand in the bunker because there was nothing to sit. Um, in case of alarm, people came for one hour or two hours, depending how long the, um, how many bombers came. Um, we have had a lot of attacks, but not in the year 1942 when the bomb, when the, when the bunker was built, because as you said, as you explained, um, bombers, British bombers at that year did not come to Berlin. And um, who was in this bunker? Everybody. Everybody means every Aryan, Aryan Germans, of course, no Jews. And people come, came in the bunker like that, or were sitting there, or went to the kitchen, and all this is fake. This is propaganda. There was no kitchen, there was no bank, and it, this is true. This, it looked like that. On the right-hand side, you see the bunker, uh, the, the train station, and you see the, how people run into the bunker, and you see this crying child on the right-hand side, again, the Anhalter station, the train station of Hitler. So it, the, this bunker was planned for um, 3,500 people, and at the end, there have been 12,000 inside. Now, at the end, on 2nd of May 1945, this was the last day of the Second World War in Berlin, um, the SS men, the stormtroopers, um, blown up the tunnel of the metro under a canal. So the complete water of the canal, Landwehrkanal, was going into this, in this tunnel system, and the tunnel, the bunker, was linked to the train station by a tunnel, and so the water came into the tunnel, and people had to leave, this 12,000 people had to leave immediately. This is a movie, this is not real. This was made the, 10 years later, but the people could remember how it was. And here you see, again, one photo from the movie, and the other one half a year, year later, September 1945, and they could all uh, still go by boat through the metro system. Okay, we are back in the year 1945. Um, down here you see the bunker, the, the roof of the bunker. Uh, Berlin is more or less destroyed. In the center uh, it is nearly 100%. Uh, the train station is so beautiful. It was um, a wonderful beauty of, um, train station. Unfortunately, destroyed in the year 1961, the year when the wall was built. And uh, nowadays, we would save it, save it, and make a cultural center like here or a market or so. But this is over. Now, um, all the years after Second World War, the bunker was used to stock food because. 
after the Berlin blockade when the Russians um, closed the roads and the trains and so to Berlin and after the Berlin airlift, the Allies, mainly the Americans, proposed or said we have to stock food for the Berliners. So to explain this again, at that time um, Germany after Second World War was separated into blue West Germany and red East Germany and in East Germany you see a yellow island. This island is Berlin and Berlin again was separated in West and East. About West Berlin was then later between 1961 and 89 the Berlin Wall and because the two million West Berliners should have food in case there was a new blockade by the Soviets, um, they, we had to stock food and the bunker was used a long, long time to have food inside. Um, that's it. We talked to a lot of two women who have been in the bunker before. Waltraud Süßmilch, she has been 14 years at that time. And also Dora Nass, she was there. You see Dora Nass and um, born in and me and my colleague Enno Lenze. She was 14 years old too. And 14 years also was Johanna Ruf. And uh, bec by 14, because in the age of 15, they had to leave. They had to go not to the front as the boys, but they had to help. And uh, the, all the girls that the complete bunker management in the year 1945 was made by girls of 14 years because the mothers were depressive. The husband was in Russia or the son or the brother, brother or so, but the young girls um, were strong enough to manage this uh, bunker. So I talked to Johanna Roof on Tuesday. Um, she is the very last, she is 93 years old now, she's the very last one who was in the, near the Hitler's bunker. She helped in, um, in other, in a bunker under the Reich Chancellery. She complains to live with all these old people nowadays who are boring and who are not interested in politics and um, she doesn't like to be in this old people's home. Um, now, this is the bunker today. You see the bunker has five levels. It's not an underground bunker. Two, two levels are underground. And this is what we are doing today with the bunker. Hitler, how could it happen? And um, documentation uh, exists since 2017. We started in 2014. We have 350,000 visitors a year. And... Um, in 2019, before COVID, and we are working without any public funding. Now, you see several photos now from how it works inside. This is the reception, uh, uh, sorry, wrong direction. Um, this cute baby is Hitler, and um, it looks quite common. It's not, not no touch screens, nothing modern. It is an exhibition like uh, like here with the posters and um, uh, many photos, uh, as many as possible, are life-size. So these Jews in Kiev are just brought to Babija to be killed. They know that they will be killed. And the visitor stands them side, uh, opposite and uh, nearly in life-size. So we work with life-size photos, with text image boards like the posters here, and with monitors. The average, average visiting time in this exhibition is three hours. Average means, uh, this is not what we measure, it's not my idea, it is Google. Google measures how long your smartphone is inside. This, I don't know if it's, this is legal, but it's cool for us. It's better, more exactly than we ever can measure. So, <clears throat> um, three hours means young people stay usually four hours and elderly people um, less. 
we have the visitors are between 25 and 20 and 35, perhaps 40, 70 percent, and 70 percent are from other countries. They come, they come with um, EasyJet and um, Fooling and other companies. So this is where they, they come from Europe mainly, from other countries too. So there is a historical reconstruction of the room where Hitler killed himself. Uh, um, and we have the cons and you visited see it like that. It's absolutely one to one to show that Hitler um, that it was very small. That the room where he where this dictator then killed himself was absolutely small. And the furniture, of course, is not original, but it is as nearly as possible. It was it looked like that. Then we have a model of the bunker of Hitler's bunker also to show that it is absolutely small and he died and he killed himself in this small bunker that this does not exist anymore. Um, it is, there is a parking place now, now on, the, on the bunker and there is an information board made by Berliner Unterwelten to inform about this bunker history. So next exhibition in the bunker is a cooperation with, with Yad Vashem in Jerusalem about women in the Holocaust. Next is the um, exhibition then we continue after 1945 what happened in Germany. Um, this is Germany 1945 till today and um, we to explain Germany in this time it needs only one picture nearly this the cross national product goes up and up and up and up and uh, this is why we are living so well so it started uh, I make a short I talk about this exhibition um, the economical development in in West in West Germany all over the world um, there was a progress then in agriculture, techni technology, science and medicine. Um, the main question of this exhibition is what happened with all the Nazis we have had. And this is very easy because the Nazis were still there. In our justice system there have been 6,000. We have a big document with 6,000 names of people who were real Nazis, Nazis judges and so and who work again, um, worked again in West Germany or they worked in the administration, or they were my teachers. So, um, my um, and um, <coughs> National Socialist um, newspapers still exist. Like this, you see National Nationalzeitung has had a circulation in 1979 of 120,000 20, every week. I know this paper very well because my father got it every week. And okay, goes, the museum goes ahead with the construction of the wall, and 1968 started with this killing of a Berlin um, student in 1967, and it's the same political development of students and young people as it is here. In 1968, students protested in Spain against the Franco regime. Um, 68 means sexual revolution too, and the um, primacy of orgasm is not so often in museums, but it's, ex ex it's important because the generation before did not know that. So fall of the Berlin Wall again is like a scene, and um, we honor, we honor uh, Angela Merkel, uh, in German, refugees in, in, uh, from Syria, they like to make selfies with her. She liked it too. And the museum ends like that in this year um, um, with the war in uh, Ukraine. This is my colleague Enno Lenze. He was there on the way to Bucha in, on 2nd of April 1922. And um, so we support a lot from the bunker, um, the war, uh, the, we, we support the Ukrainians, so we send nearly every week um, cars with helmets and with bulletproof vests and at the moment a lot of medical stuff. 
and um, to help them and in this war. We have next exhibition in the war is about memes in the Ukraine. Memes is, you know that from the internet, it's propaganda from, from down to top. Usually propaganda is from the propaganda minister from top to down and memes is the contrary. So everybody um, can make, produce memes, and it is against the Russians and to create hope and uh, optimism um, with the, in, with the, um, with the um, Ukrainians. So, you see over there, um, the government is intelligent and clever enough in the Ukraine to understand that these memes have to be supported and they make stamps of it. And um, that's it. And um, on, in, in blue is the uh, Mariana. She was visiting us 10 days ago um, because she wanted to see this ex exhibition if they can use things like that in the tourism tourism in the Ukraine now. Now there are some more visitors. You see three um, ambassadors of the of Israel. The last one, um, uh, Ron Prosor over there was there last Sunday Sunday before and he he visited us three hours and the the big photo is um, Amy Goodman, Professor Amy Goodman, and her husband, Professor Michael McDoyle. Uh, she is the um, ambassador of the United States of America, and she visited us uh, several days before Christmas. Now, um, in the bank, we have a publishing house. We, book, we publish books about German history and um, and Nazi time. We have more than 250 um, titles about that. The books are sold directly from Palettes in the bunker. This is the bunker. We have a bookshop in the bunker like that, but of course, sell, of course, have a, a web shop and sell with Ama of, um, via Amazon and others. So this is our last action. La on 24th of February, one year after the uh, Russians uh, invaded Ukraine. We placed this Russian tank um, in front of the Russian embassy in Berlin. You see on this side the Russian embassy, though the cannon goes to the Russian embassy, you see in the background um, Brandenburg Gate and we wanted to um, this is this Russian tank, a T-72, was destroyed in the Ukraine by Ukrainians on the 31st of March 1920, uh, 2022, two days before Enno, my colleague Enno was there in the same, on the same place. So um, we would like to, uh, to support the Ukrainians from the bunker. And um, this is um, the, the ambassador of the Ukraine was there, Alexei Makeyev. He is a tough boy, man, man, because he, he came without bodyguards. And you see on the side, the, the, uh, the, the, the embassy of the enemies, of the Russians. So he came in front of the Russian um, embassy and the windows you see are the ones from FS, FSB, from the Secret Service. So the Secret Service was watching what the ambassador is doing there. Now this is the press conference, was very good. Um, Reuters streamed online our press conference. We have had the world press over there and um, that's it. Now, if you want to know what we are doing, check berlinstory.de. And if you want to know what I am thinking about this conference later, you can check wielandgiebel.de. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, this is, would be a good idea. You can see that on Twitter, on Facebook, not so often, on Instagram. Ah, yesterday, because I was so impressed by the situation of um, Barcelona now, it's really cool. And you can follow Enno Lenzo, my colleague. He is uh, more active in Twitter. He has 66,000 66, followers because he often is in the war in uh, 
Kurdistan, Iraq, in Afghanistan, and now next week again in the Ukraine again. That's it. This is the history of the bunker and of what we are doing now. Thanks a lot. Gracias. Okay, so now we'll pass the floor over to Carmen Miró. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me to these days, especially Xavi Domenac and Ana Sánchez. And I admire your work, but I was a privileged a spectator of at the very beginning, and we hope it will end here. We've only just started these two days, and many things have come up, things that really make us think. And and we're here to talk about underground memory or under earth memory. I'm an archaeologist, as many of you know. And when you talk about under earth, you talk about subsoil. But there are many ways of covering. There is another way of covering that that is more important to stress and not so common, not so obvious, which is a covering due to many issues, especially fear. How many historic facts, events have disappeared due to fear? And I'm talking about conflict. And when we talk about a conflict, we can never forget fear. Fear is always apologize for the presentation. So we are in the 21st century, and we are at war. Who would have said that Europe would go through another war? But what has happened since the Second World War? We could give you a long list of wars. I'm sure you can think of two easily in Europe, the Balkan uh, War that we have all uh, lived through, and the Ukraine War. But we cannot forget the war in Vietnam, Cambodia. We cannot forget the war on Iraq where they told us that air raids were preventative tactics. I like the word preventative in archaeology, but maybe in military terms it's not so interesting. So we're talking about these underground memory and where we come from. And I love this sentence by the great Maria Aurelia Campagne, who says, surely it is the people awareness of the present moment that pushes me to explain the origins. The Spanish Civil War will not be explained in the same way now in the face of the Ukrainian war. So we explain it differently now than a few years ago. We are where we are, and we interpret facts based on current times. And Miguel Martí Paul, those of you who know me know I admire him. And he has uh, this poem, of a uh, book of short poems, that I always use, which is, you carefully rebuild the past that leads you to where you are now. And this is why, what archaeologists do. We remake, we rebuild the past. Why do we do it? Do we want to focus on history, proto-history, prehistory? No, we do this in order to try and move forward towards a future moment. And this leads us to a big word, uncertainty. When we talk about archaeology, there is always uncertainty. But not only when we talk about archaeology, when we talk about war, when we talk about conflict, and we talk about this underground memory, uncertainty is always present. What is uncertainty? There is not one single sentence. There are many. So uncertainty prevails. Going back to memory. Memory is remembering, the fact of remembering. And here we have a text from Silvia de la Cohan, a book on writing fiction, but I recommend it because it's very interesting how it makes you think about memory, past, present, and future. And she says, a memory is an imprint that gives meaning to our life. It is about going back to the past to understand the present and to project oneself into the future. And I always like saying that archaeology is a fragile balance between past, present, and future. And when I 
came across this quote, I thought, well, yeah, it's similar to what I've always wanted to explain. So we can attach many adjectives to memory. We will see it happens also with history and archaeology. And a few years ago, I have colleagues here who have been with me for many years, Jordi Guichet, Uriel López, Ricard, who I cannot see at the moment, Ramón Arnabat. They have been my colleagues for many years, my dear Jordi Ramos as well. And we started debating, I'm sure you'll remember, and I also remember Xavi Domenac at uh, some sessions that we organized years ago where we started talking about this, and it seemed like some defend talking about memory and others defend talking about history, but no, we have to talk about all of it. Memory is part of history, and history needs to recover memory. Let's not make a confrontation between them. Let's all, we're all here to talk about conflict. Let's not divide even more. We have democratic memory, we have selected memory, we have memory and oblivion, but memory for recent history is basic because we have people amongst us who experience these events. And we just saw some pictures presented by our guests from Berlin of people who lived in the, who were in the bunkers. And I'm sure that the memories they have now when they're 90 are not the same memories they had when they were 20 at the end of the war because our memory transforms and evolves. But let's talk about history. Oh, history. Historians are objective. No, sorry, we're not. Here I'm showing a text from Walter Benjamin because he is a reference when we talk about the Spanish Civil War, and he talks about this, about who makes history, normally the victors. Let's take a look at history books from the beginning of the Franco regime, what they said about the, the war and the Masonic separatist armies. This is the story that we want, the history that we want. It was a history that was taught about in the day, but not only Walter Benjamin, also Tacitus, who said, do not listen to rumors. There's only one true history. What was the true history for Tacitus, that of the emperors or that of the people? Is there a true history or many? There are, there's one memory and many histories, and unfortunately, history belongs to the victor, victors, and they don't, only, they don't always say what we would have liked. During the first talk, Professor Lowe told us about the history of the Brits, who were the winners, but they were destroyers as well. And in Germany, I'm sure many people suffered as well. We depict uh, Germans as the evil ones, but there's no black and white. Let's try to find a balance. And what do we reach then? Heritage. Heritage is the inheritance of a culture of the past with which a people experiences the present and conveys it to future generations. Heritage is not so subjective. It can be, depending on how we interpret it, but it's somewhat solid. And now on to archaeology. Archaeology is the scientific discipline which studies the data of the past in the most objective manner. Not completely objective, because the person interpreting it can be subjective as well, but it talks about material culture, so it's more difficult to alter it. If I encounter an air raid shelter and I document it, I'm documenting the shelter. Of course, a person may come and say, oh no, here they were it's not an arid shelter because uh, people used it to grow mushrooms. This is what happened in in the 307 shelter. Well, yes, people used it for that, but it is an arid shelter, and archaeology can confirm that. Here we have a definition of archaeology, but we could have chosen another, a thousand more. Professor Terradello also has a very good one. Archaeology is a very heterogeneous discipline, and we need to work in interdisciplinary teams. This is where we really make headway. Let's go back to adjectives. We talked about memory with adjectives, history with adjectives, and archaeology can have many adjectives. The study of the past through material remains. We have urban archaeology, landscape archaeology, but now we will focus on the archaeology of conflict. Normally, when we talk about archaeology of conflict, 
Well, people, I wanted to undermine it a bit because if it seems like if we're talking about the war, we are pro-war, but no, talking about the war means talking about peace. Shall we forget all of the histories of the war? Of the war? No. How many kids in secondary education know who Franco was and what happened here during the dictatorship? We need to give them a new reading to explain that here we went through a time where fascists did what they wanted. So talking about the archaeology of conflict is talking about peace and talking about preventing things that we were not able to prevent in the past. And archaeology also talks about urban configuration. I always want, I like talking about uh, Barcelona and well, my talk should be generalistic, but I've worked in Barcelona, so I will focus on Barcelona a bit. And this is an idea that I copied from Enrique Lineda de Tours. This, it is a space, a city is a space that man has transformed. And there are three spaces, three areas to bear in mind the space, time, time must go by, the beginning and the end, and mankind without humankind, things do not change. Each group that installs in a... When a group settles into a piece of space, it transforms it into its own image and likeness. And this is what transformed history with different methodologies. And here we have a quote by Maurice Holbach uh, from La Memoire Collective, a book that I recommend, and he says precisely it is. Each community needs to adapt to the space. We cannot explain conflict which without explaining space. And Professor Lowe also explained it. It's not the same thing to bomb a territory with or without clouds, or you can not install raiders in flatlands. It's more difficult to bomb. To bomb the mountains as compared to the beach. So the landscape is vital in order to understand a conflict. The city is the great deposit of collective memory. And here we go back to the concept of archaeology, the concept of the city, we are in Barcelona, and the concept of collective memory. And there are two quotes that I use, often one from Narcis Felipe de la Peña from the 18th century, who says, cities are not made up of stones but of their inhabitants. And there's another quote that I love from Mortimer Boiler who says, archaeologists do not unearth things, but people, we must unearth the lives of people who live there and the life, in this case, of all citizens who were here in Barcelona at the beginning of the bombings and using the words um, said by Anna during the introduction, mainly women and children that we have not talked about enough. We are in a patriarchal society and the role of women has been often silenced. And also an idea of Aldo Rossi, who studied this concept of city as collective memory, and he said, over time, oh, the city grows on itself. It acquires awareness and memory. These concepts of bomb cities as symbols, I remember, for example, how impressed I was by the Coventry Cathedral when I went there, the Gothic uh, cathedral and the new one, and there are many aspects, many layers, there are religious, but heritage as well. And now we all see the cathedral avenue and we think, oh, these, uh, we see it so clearly, the facade is so nice, but there were two very narrow streets there that were bombed destroyed, and this is why we now have an avenue. So a conflict changes the city, and the war leaves a footprint, leaves marks, and a differential fact, especially in Barcelona. What happens in Barcelona? Here we've talked about the Barcelona model, and I will not give you a, a historic introduction. Xavi Domenech has given us a very good introduction at the beginning of the day, and Anna rounded it up with all of these concepts of shelters. But we, I would like to stress something very important, the change of military tactics change the transformation of the city. Here we have a city that transforms itself, but with a differential fact, 
uh, bombings, the rear war becomes the front line, and things have to change. Cities in the rear war, rear guard had not been bombed, bombed very much by then, and then they started bombing them, and the rear guard could not support the front line, so it has to organize a passive defense. And these lead to moral consequences and social consequences, a reorganization of Barcelonians. And again, we talk about fear. Fear installs itself over citizens. And all those of you who've had grandparents who lived in Barcelona or in different areas, not in smaller villages where it was different, they can tell you how they run to the shelters. And I think I'm running out of time. Well, I'll summarize. We're talking about space and memories. These are concepts that I would like to make clear. A city leaves us in constant transformation. A city is a deposit of collective memory. What is heritage? We add many adjectives to heritage. We need to recover our heritage, but citizens must believe in and, and love and preserve their heritage. Then we have known and unknown heritage, which is not less important than the former, and integral actions on heritage. Legislation, what do we preserve and how we do we do it? Barcelona is a differential fact. We talk about the Barcelona model, but we should also bear in mind that at a certain point, Barcelona was the capital of three governments. The Republican government, the Catalan government, and the Basque government. And Tavi may know this better than I do, but I do not know of any other cases like this, any other cities like this, a, a city that therefore was so brutally bombed. There were three presidents, government presidents, who were sought here. And I would like to finish with a concept that I would like to defend, which is the silenced heritage, a heritage that we know that has been hidden, covered up. The heritage does not become less of a heritage because it's silence, and there is a lot of silence heritage still. And the exhibit and shelters, when we started working with shelters, some people laugh at us, laughed at what it meant to work with shelters. And I think in Barcelona, just like this morning the deputy mayor said, we were pioneers in documenting and working and studying shelters, and we must give a voice to this silenced heritage, the voice of citizens, the voice of Barcelona. And I will finish with poetry. Poetry is one of my passions. This is by Don Michoy, a female poet, the DMZ colony. She is Korean, and this is on the war on Korea, and I will read it. Poetry is most effective as a language for the resistance. Poetry can defy oblivion, and I wish that my work would generate literary resistance against geopolitical borders, including the borders of literary and language conventions. Let's, let's read poetry, let's recover our heritage, and this was done thanks to a team effort, and I would like to thank everyone. And I cannot quote everyone who has worked here, but I would like to give a shout out to the subsoil unit of the Catalan police, because a lot of the work done in Barcelona could not have been done without them. Their uh, willful and silent work has always been there uh, with us, and we must thank them. Thank you very much. Let's move on now and give the floor to Gil so Thomas. I am going to present you some samples of the different shelters uh, which exist, which still exist in Paris and in the suburb, but it will be only a few samples because just in, inside Paris we, we had more than 40,000 shelters and most of them are still in place. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, in France, the first Wednesday of each month, we can hear the sound of a siren, like the siren you can see on the right. And uh, it, it was a, an, it's, it's an exercise to prepare people to a future alert. And it, it, not only for an aerial alert, it could be a chemical accident and so on. So it's an exercise. And so each month, uh, the first Wednesday of each month, and it dates of the Second World War, because it was 
put in place during the Second World War, or just before the Second World War, but what you used to name civil defense, but in France we name it passive defense. So you can, you can see a, a, a siren still in place. This siren date of, a, of the Second World War, the, the photo was taken by my partner, who is somewhere here. And uh, this siren is on the top of the roof of the main city hall of Paris. So in, in 1870, there was a war, uh, uh, fr uh, France, France against Prussia, and for the first time, Paris was bomb bombed by, 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 by cannons which were uh, uh, in the suburb of Paris. And for the first time, Parisian went into the basement to, to be protected from the, the bombing. And 45 years later, uh, Paris was still bombed but from the, 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 the air, like London, and uh, Paris was bombed by, uh, by plane, by airship, and also by a long and big cannon, which was in, at 120 kilometers from Paris. This is the impact that uh, we can, we can uh, find in Paris uh, between 1914 and 1918. So during the, the First World War, Parisian went back to the to the basement of the house. Like you can you can see on the on the top left uh, photos, but they also can use the metro or the or the shelters because the metro or the structure was, was put in place uh, in 1900 from 1900. And 20, 20 years later, it was uh, the, the preparation of the Second World War. And the, the government decided to, to organize a serious uh, civil defense because uh, uh, the, uh, the government realized that maybe the, the, the German want, wanted to have a revenge. So they, we were a little bit late if you compare with London, with, with English, with uh, Russian, with Italian, uh, and so on. But uh, when we, we prepare this, uh, this uh, civil defense, we organize also. Um, uh, exhibition to, to show to people what kind of shelter they can build or they, they can uh, pay to, to have. For instance, uh, on the left, it's uh, the, fair, the International Fair of 1937, and there was a building totally devoted to, to the different shelters. But I know that you, you want to see some relics of the different shelters uh, which still exist in, in Paris or in the suburb. So uh, I identify three key, key kinds of shelters, trenches, trenches civilian shelters, gas-proof shelters, plus another one that I'm going to explain. Uh, metro station during the Second World War were not considered as shelters, but only as refuges. So if you want to, to, see, to see the rigs of the different shelters, you just have to, to follow the errors. So I began by, by trenches, because uh, it's the easiest shelters uh, that uh, we, we can build. We just have to dig to, to create uh, trenches. And just in Paris, we, we built, we, we, we dug around 35 kilometers of trenches. And to, to, dug, to, to dig these trenches, we need arms. So we have lots of people. We, who were able to, to, to dig the trenches. It was workers or scouts or, or, or soldiers or unemployed people, but we can also use uh, uh, construction machines, uh, like you can, you can see on the right. These, these, different, uh, these two photos were, were, were taken uh, at the level of the Luxembourg Garden, because most of the shelters, of course, were in the Garden of Paris. And on, on the left, you can see a shelters, uh, uh, trenches, uh, a photo taken during the Second World War, and in this shelter, in this uh, trench, you have uh, kids, but if, if it's, it was uh, uh, adult, you have four adult by meter, uh, two uh, face to face, and if it's kids, you have six uh, people by, by meters. And on the right, you have the photo of the same trench uh, today. Another, another kind of shelter as uh, the basement of the building. So we, if, we want, if we want to consider that uh, the basement uh, can be used as a shelter, we, we had to reinforce it by wood. So on the left, it's a uh, theory. On the right, it's a model at the scale one-to-one, -one, which was presented uh, uh, in the International Fair of 1937. 
a photo of, of the, this kind of shelter today. R so reinforced, reinforced by wood. Another kind of reinforced wood or reinforcing shelter. But we can also reinforce basement with metal. So this is a theory. This is uh, wh what we can find today. Another view. So this kind of basement, reinforced basement, reinforced by wood or metal, uh, represent more than 40,000 shelters. And it was for, for, the, for, for, the, for the civilian people. So it, it, uh, 40,000 civilian shelters, it, it's 2,000 shelters by district in Paris. We have an, another kind of shelter, it was a gas-proof shelter. So these gas-proof shelters was made with uh, concrete. If you want to, to enter into, into it, you have to, to, to go through uh, an airlock. So you can see on the, on the photo on the left, you can see a door and a, another door because you have an airlock. Because we, we, at that time, we were frightened by attack with gas. And you have to purify the air of the shelter. So on the right, it's a filter. So to, to activate the purification of the air, you can use bike or by hand. Bike on the, on the left and by hand on the right. So in Paris, we, we built 250 gas-proof shelters, plus one gas-proof shelters below schools, and plus 100 shelters in the suburb, in the near suburb. And we, we have, a, 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 when I present the, the different shelters, I say that there are three kinds of shelters. There, there are the trenches, there are the reinforced basement, and we, there are the gas-proof shelters. And the, another kind of shelter, which is not really a shelter, it's the underground, gas-proof underground hospital. So in Paris, we built something like 30 gas-proof underground hospitals. Many of them are below, below uh, city halls, and we have some gas-proof shelters hospital below schools. And in this shelter, in this gas-proof shelter uh, underground uh, hospital, it was to, to cure injured people by bombs, by gas, or by, uh, by, by fire, but they never been used. The metro ca can also be, be used as a, as a refuge, as I explained, because we, we distinguish in the metro the the refuge and the shelter, and the shelter is gas-proof refuge, and we have only three gas-proof refuge in, in the metro. The other one, the other 50 underground metro was only refuge. And uh, for people, when they went into the, the metro station to be, to be protected, they, don't, they didn't use only the platform, they used also part of the, of the, of the tunnel. So you can see people in a metro station, and you can see how they, they go from the platform to the level of the track. They use mobile uh, staircase like on the right. In Paris, we, we are lucky because we also have uh, 100 kilometers of all underground limestone quarries. We have 250 kilo, between 250 to 280 kilometers of, uh, of uh, underground quarries. And I say we are lucky because I enjoy to, to, to walk into these, these quarries. So uh, the, two, the two black and white photos on the, on the top uh, were taken in 1936 when we, we, we thought, is it possible to convert this underground shelter underground quarries into shelters. So this is, uh, on the top, this is a photo today. But uh, the difference with the, the quarries in the suburb, in the suburb, the, the quarries are very wide, very high. You can enter into these quarries by truck. But in Paris, inside Paris, the quarries are at around 20 meters deep. So if you want to create a shelter, you have first to, to create a, uh, a staircase leading to, to 20 meters deep, so it's not easy to, to, to do. And on the map on the, on the, on the left, it represents only the, the fifth, the sixth, the, the 14, and the 15 district. And I represent by circle the almost 20 places where shelters were built. And for, for, uh, for people who, who visit recently Paris, there is, uh, a fa famous shelter is this one, where the insurrection of Paris were organized, and it's the only sh shelter that you can officially visit. It was at Danfer Square, just below the, the, the Museum of Liberation, and it was used 
it was a, a civil uh, shelter, but it was used by Roald Tanguy, the, the chief of the resistance, only the five last, year, uh, last days of the, of, the, of the occupation of Paris, of Paris during the insurrection. So, as, as you want to see, to see your, uh, now relics of shelters, uh, I am going to, to end my, my presentation by different photos taken in different shelters. So, you can see here uh, uh, inscription left um, in, in civilian shelters at the level of the basement. So, the photo on the right or the two photos on the left rep represent the emergency exit of these shelters. So we, we, we prepare a, 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 weak, a weak wall, very, very easy to destroy if we need to exit from, from the shelter, and if the staircase used to enter into the shelter was impossible to, to, to use. So you have French inscription, but during the occupation, when the, 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 the Nazi uh, use some building in Paris, of course, if there is a shelter below Paris, below this, uh, this building, they uh, reuse this shelter and they put the indication in German. So this is German ins inscription that it's still possible, it was still possible to, to see, because uh, the two on the, on the top, the two bottom on the right and on the center has now destroyed by, by, because we decided to build an, another thing at, at the place at the same place. So as a, as a German inscription, we can, uh, the, the previous inscription uh, were, were official, but there was also handmade inscription, like the, the two, uh, the, the inscription on the top and uh, the inscription on, on the left, indicate 23rd of March 1918, and it was the first time where was used the big cannon at 120 kilometers of Paris. So we discover these two inscriptions in, in basement of building. So this inscription uh, on the left was, um, it was exceptional because it, it, it's on a door and it's uh, written with chalk and it indicates that uh, the, the engine w was checked the 27th of December 1939 and it's still in place. Another kind of, ins another inscription, the 4th of April 1933. It was when uh, the Renault factory was bomb bombed for the second time. And uh, so this, all these four inscriptions have now disappeared. By, as you can see on the two photos on the, at the bottom, they, they, when I took the, the photo, they began to, to be covered by tags, and now they're totally covered by a mural by people who visit illegally the quarries and don't respect the quarries, and they tag everywhere, everywhere. And the photo on the top and the left indicates the 14th of July 1944. So it, it's, Paris was still occupied by the, by, the, by the German, and the 14th of July is National Day. And you can see two flags at the bottom of this photo, a, a French and, and, and a British flag. As a uh, inscription uh, that we can find that there are dozens and dozens of uh, inscriptions indic uh, indicating some different alerts which, which, uh, which uh, uh, we had at that time. And I'm sorry for the English, but on the, on the bottom on the right, it's written death to the English because we know that uh, English bombarded uh, Paris and the suburb. And, uh, and the, the last photo with inscription, uh, on the left, it was a symbol of the, on the French resistance, the V for victory, and the uh, Lorraine cross uh, above the V. And on the right, it was an inscription left the 6th of June 1944, so during the Norm Normandy landing. Because we know, even in the, in the, in the cell in jail, uh, at the exact day uh, when it happened, we know the Americans arrived in France at the exact day. So it's my, my, my last, my last uh, photo because it's written, this is the end of the, this, this is the end of the part of the, of the um, basement which can be used as a shelter. And this is the emergen emergency exit. And in, in Montparnasse Cemetery, we have a, a memorial to, to members of the, of the civil defense we, which were killed in mission. And uh, it's, it's a grave. It's a grave where uh, below, below this grave, uh, we, we buried 156 victim of members of the civil defense. And if, if you have some interest uh, about this relics, I, I, I brought with me some, 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 some uh, copies of uh, the two books that I, I, I wrote uh, about the French shelters. Thank you.
Buenos días. Eh, agradezco a, a los organizadores de estas jornadas, así como... Good morning, I would like to thank the organizers and everyone here for making this possible, for making this possible to talk about such um, a topic that I'm so passionate about, such as area shelters in Barcelona, revolutionary infrastructure that revolutionized the physical aspect of the war so many years ago. And however, today it has become invisible. Where are these shelters? When I started my research, I suddenly was faced with the series of difficulties that came due to this occult, invisible nature of shelters and the impossibility to see these spaces that I was studying. So I wondered what led a city to digging, to carrying out this huge uh, digging process and what were the conditions that ensued and the research focused on three periods that we believe to be determinant for the understanding of why shelters came into existence, why since the end of the war they started to become disconnected and forgotten and why during the transition and after they started to be unveiled and appreciated by the citizens. All of these with the goal of trying to think about what to do with these shelters. What was the response of citizens to shelters? What were the characteristics that made it difficult to connect them with the surface? And what is the role of the dissemination of knowledge and studies when understanding these spaces that are invisible to citizens. So, in order to understand this new architecture for the fence, which was capable of, as I said, revolutionizing the visual aspect of the city at war, we must bear some a determinant fact in mind, aerial warfare the introduction of planes in military tactics, an agile element that would drop a projectile from a high altitude that was very destructive with a weight between 25 and 200 kilos that could penetrate five to six meters into farming land, the calculations are not certain, but and, and this dissolution of, or this blurring of any lines changes this, this reality. And these more than 1,500 shelters made up some sort of an underground fortress, as I like to call it. And we must bear in mind that the industrial city had created productive centers that had become a source of wealth and therefore the top target in the theories of total warfare. So this underground fortress came up as a mode of resistance to these attacks that attempted to create chaos among citizens and stopping productive centers, cities. And we must also bear in mind another determining aspect that came up during the industrial society, which was the fact that some mechanisms were generated for the colonization of normally inhabitable spaces, such as the colonization of the airspace and the development that ensued in lighting and ventilation mechanisms that made it possible to inhabit these uninhabitable spaces, uninhabitable spaces. So we must understand that building shelters is something that happened very quickly in a context of chaos stemming from the first bombings that took place in February 1937. And the city in that context of chaos, what I would like to mainly stress too, representative phenomena which were mainly how we started 
seeing a lot of soil around shelters, soil that on most occasions had to become a protective layer against the impact of the bombs. And a series of gates, entry gates that connected these shelters with the surface. And we must bear in mind that for most citizens in Barcelona, these gates were the first contact with the underground, with the subsoil, because in Barcelona, it was not so normalized to use the underground space as it is today. And these gates and these aspects gave shape to the architecture of war. Air raid shelters had no background. These new bombing techniques, the systematic bombings on cities, was something that happened mainly during the Civil War, so there was no background. And citizens in this context of chaos had to use techniques that were used in traditional architecture. I always like to mention, for example, water mines and how they adapted them to have the adequate dimensions for people. And, for example, water wells were adapted into air raid shelters so that they could guarantee ventilation. So we must bear in mind something that is quite representative, which is that while shelters were being built, on many occasions people accessed them. It was a mixed period. Building and inhabiting the space happened at the same time. And this, well, you will see later how, why this is such a determining factor, but what I wanted to stress here mainly is that whereas these shelters, there was an, an attempt to regulate them through rules and regulations, through the Passive Defense Board, uh, determining well the access gates, stairwells, the way accesses should be built to avoid uh, shrapnel going in, uh, dimensions, capacity. These shelters, the necessary mechanisms, as we said before, to guarantee ventilation, lighting, water supply, all of the necessary equipment for any sort of emergency that would take place in that underground space disconnected from the above ground space. Well, there was a will to standardize these spaces, but the chaos of war prevented it from happening, prevented standardization. And during my work, I saw that, yes, there was a pattern of these mine shaft style gallery, uh, but every shelter is different. Every shelter is different depending on the depth, uh, where it's located, the type of uh, protection against uh, bombs. You cannot say that once you've seen one shelter, you've seen them all, because each shelter has its own history. And therefore, and this is what I was saying before, I was talking about the importance of the finishings of the shelter and these immersion in the in the underground that Barcelona citizens experience. We must realize that the cohesion cohesion of the territory of the land conveyed stability to the the mine. And in a context of chaos and emergency due to the bombings, spaces were used that were not adequate. They were precarious. I mean the land the soil conveyed stability, ceramic walls and Catalan vaults were used, the ground was basically compacted earth, and so this encapsulation, this enveloping was what protected from the, the impact, the shock of the bombs, but there were still 
some detachments uh, of different elements and, and, and fixtures due to the the shocks and over time during my work I've understood the importance of these coatings, these linings, because they conveyed this idea of order. And oftentimes, these shelters are created with urgency, but, and, and people felt like they were being buried. People expressed the feeling that they, they, they felt like they were being buried in these spaces, which generated a wave of rejection towards these shelters. So I would like to stress the importance and, and how traumatic it was. I mean, these were spaces that tried to provide the adequate living conditions and all of the characteristics were thought of for a good for good use, but due to the lack of resources and the chaos of work, well, it, 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 all of that led to these experiences of, of feeling buried and feeling buried. And at some point, uh, and after the end of the war, these shelters were no longer built and they were no longer used. And society was a society of people who were tired of the war, traumatized by the bombings neighbor associations who had dealt with the building of the shelters and well at the end of the war there was this general will and, and there are some stories talking about how the Franco regime tried to hide these shelters to make people forget about them but in other other people believe that on the contrary, Frank, the Franco regime studied these infrastructures to reuse them in case of future attacks to the city. But the, the truth is that there was a general process of forgetting these spaces, dismantling gates and accesses. Some shelters were subsequently used as houses or as warehouses for buildings. And during the first few years of the war, they became deconstructed, all of the protective soil was removed, and slowly but surely they became part of a bad memory for those who experienced the war, and they became a place in the imaginary of the new generations that would get to know them through the testimonials of their family members. And so in order to start understanding the phenomenon of discovery, we must understand that these shelters were very few times conceived to last over time. They were just conceived to provide an answer to a one-off need of shelter. And they were slowly but surely forgotten and lost until two things happened at the same time. On the one hand, urban, developing, urban development work which happened in the city during the 80s and 90s. And these works uncovered these spaces in the eyes of citizens who were directly or indirectly impacted by the facts of the war. And in a new context that allowed for a new reading in order to claim the historic value of these spaces by attaching meaning to them. And when these structures started popping up, there was a wave of curiosity and some people accessed and documented these spaces, but there was no narrative back then telling this story of uh, shelters and, and conveying its, their memory and the interest generated by the shelters that kept popping up led to the documentation of these shelters, and mainly thanks to Jose Maria Contel, Jose Puchado, who were two of the pioneers of the study of shelters, and who generated a growing interest 
that was a determinant for reconnecting with these spaces. And also due to all of the characteristics that we've seen before, the conditions of lack of uh, safety and precariousness of these shelters led to a series of solutions. Shelters were reconnected uh, to their historic value, to remember the facts of the war, or in becoming active centers for peace, which was one of the premises for the creation of the Museum of the Shelter at the Plaza del Diamant, the Diamant Square. So all of these new readings came up, and I would like to talk a bit about these new ways of connecting shelters through the experience of my work. The first few visits that I made to shelters happened in, in museums. The first uh, shelter that I visited was the 307 shelter, the museum. It had, due to its characteristics, it was somewhat stable, so it was possible to visit it and then disseminate the main events of the war, always with the with elements guaranteeing the, the, the safety of those visiting the shelter. And it, it was a good mechanism, a good way of representing or trying to represent what these spaces meant back in the day. But there were also other ways of reconnecting with these spaces through citizens. For example, another example was these connections and acknowledgements especially in cultural centers, such as in the Quinardo Center, the La Lira Cultural Center, that incorporated these objects as a treasure, these objects that were heritage, memory, and that were part of their identity. And there were other spaces that materialized as the consequences of those conflicts of interest that had taken place around urban development and the resistance that aimed at maintaining, preserving those very representative spaces. And others, the more collective shelters in the public space were paused, uh, remained paused, because it was impossible to reconnect them with citizens. What happened here in all cases that I think is important is uh, this time clash between in, with this contrast of materials. These are spaces that are devoid of all information, all narrative. And what is perceived here is the footprint of time, old materials compared to the new materials, leading to curiosity and research. And on the other hand, as these shelters became more inaccessible, it was impossible to access them, and then we become dependent on representations that have reached us in video or picture format and we become more and more far removed from the actual physical space of the shelter. And we become further and further removed from the actual spaces. And here we can see very interesting findings by the archaeology service where we can see these remains, these pieces of shelters that will probably never reconnect with the city, but which could actually have an impact, a real impact on anyone seeing them. And I would like to mention this new type of representation proposed by the archaeology service, which would be a tool that would allow us to 
in a way, provide a solution to these physical limitations that we have when experiencing shelters. But I wonder, what does it entail not being able to access these shelters and not being able to perceive them in the very place, especially these, these spaces that are so marked and through which there is an emotional bond. So what does it mean for the understanding of these spaces? I would like to, in order to express the, the importance of these narratives and stories that generate around shelters and mainly due to the lack of access that we have in most of them, I would like to show you this picture that I received of a friend, an illustrator, sent it to me because I, I talked to him about shelters and he was able to, without having accessed the shelters, he was able to represent by reading testimonials and our work, he was able to represent the ambience that you could have experienced back in the day in the shelters. So what do we do with shelters? Just to finish, I, I would like to claim the capacity they have to evoke something different. And I would like to stress a paradox that I think is a determinant factor for shelters, which is that the conditions that would allow us to have a, an idea, a, a feeling of what people perceived back in the day are the very conditions that do not allow us to access shelters. So I would like to stay with that and to also claim the importance of a physical space and an architecture which set a precedence, precedent in war architecture linked to cities. And just to finish, I would like to give you a quote by Judith Pujado, written in 2006, that I think is very representative of all of this process of reconnecting with shelters. It is obvious that not all shelters will be recovered. And well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the last intervention connects very well with uh, the question I'm uh, going to ask you to our speakers and then we will have 15 minutes for a Q&A. You were asking what does it mean if we cannot access to shelters and I would like to ask all our speakers how do we work to make these places more public? How have you been working in your uh, countries to make these places known? And what problems have you been uh, facing? And uh, I don't know if you want to talk uh, from the Catalan perspective and from other countries' perspectives, what have been the obstacles for you to get these places known? In the case of Barcelona, we have 1,322. That's an interesting topic. Preserve, it doesn't mean turn this place into a museum. And uh, that's because that's difficult, particularly in Barcelona. And here we have a representative from the subsoil uh, unit of the Catalan police because these underground spaces are dangerous spaces. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have to protect people first. So some places are impossible to turn into a museum, these underground places. We have to choose when and where. And uh, if we cannot preserve uh, these places, well, uh, we have to make decisions uh, if uh, we cannot um, preserve these places that cost money because we can open to the public a space, but then we don't have the money to preserve it. Uh, and um, there is no further management, and we have to close that public space. So we have to think carefully. Maybe we can give different use to these uh, places. Maybe, and I'm going to talk about new technologies. Uh, here we were talking about
about 3D. Well, thanks to 3D, many people who cannot go to shelters can visit these shelters. Let's think about people who are in a wheelchair or who cannot move uh, or, or people, for instance, parents that go with a push chair. So thanks to 3D images, so uh, senior people or maybe people who have reduced mobility, who cannot uh, take stairs. Uh, we know that many uh, shelters have steps, so they can visit these places through uh, 3D representations or images. And I think new technologies help us to produce these 3D images. And then we have to choose carefully what shelters and how we open them to the public, because uh, um, this sensation of fear cannot be reproduced uh, with a 3D image because, um, well, it, it, it's different. So we have to talk about conflict in order to talk about peace and give value to the heritage we have in the city. And um, the, the goal is not to turn everything into a museum. I think that putting signs explaining is important. and. Not now we have a website where we can find all written documents, photographies linked to air raid shelters. And that's a tool also to help a um, citizens to have access to the information. But I don't think uh, we have to fall into the trap of thinking that all shelters can, can be turned into museums. So uh, in, in France, and uh, I, I know Paris, but for, for the France it's the same, uh, it's very recently that, uh, that archaeologists and historians studied uh, the shelters. Uh, the different photos I presented you, um, most of them I, I, did, did, I took them with no authorization because I, am, I have been studying the, the shelters for more than 40 years, and uh, it's very difficult to... to to explain to archaeologists that they have an, an historical importance. I, I consider that it's only around 2018 uh, that archaeologists uh, realized that uh, shelters, uh, uh, civil, civil defense shelters, has an, uh, an historic importance for the Second World War, but they just eventually studied the, the, the shelters. The, the different students I, I know who studied, who, is, who are studying the, the shelters, uh, do these studies uh, very officially, but they, they keep on going into the shelters with no authorization because most of the shelters are below, below official or below administrative building or below private building, so it's very difficult to obtain authorization. And the only way to, to present the shelters is symposium like this one, or to, to write papers, to publish different things, or to uh, realize 3D, 3D um, mapping, uh, but it's very difficult to open, to open shelters to public and for instance when you, you 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 have the opportunity to come to paris the only one you can visit is a shelter where we organized the insurrection of paris it was uh, the only one which is open every day uh, because it's below uh, the, the museum of liberation and from time to time it's possible to, to for instance to visit two or three part of small trenches, but only occasionally during, for instance, a patrimonial day, or, or, but generally they are not open because when you open an underground structure in France, and I, I think it's uh, the same in Europe, you need an access and at least one or two emergency exit, and you need to have electricity, you need to have, you have so many content that it's very difficult to open shelters. So the, the only way to present shelters is publication, co conference, and so on. Uh, for me, for me, it's different. Um, I spent half of my life in the bunker, and we invite everybody to come. The shelter is open every single day in the year, also Christmas, first of May, and whenever. Money, um, we 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 make money, and we do not wait for tax money to come that somebody gives us the money. So everybody is invited to come every time to the bunker.
Ahora, sí. Eh, me gustaría sobre todo eh, comentar lo que... I would like eh, to answer karma and to clarify a little bit the topic of the presentation of the shelter. I think it's a good tool, particularly when we talk of making these shelters accessible, because we're talking here about the spaces that are not safe, maybe, but precisely for that, we can understand the feeling experienced by the citizens at that time. And uh, this is why we cannot access a shelter. However, it doesn't mean that shelters are not a good tool because it allows us, but it's this um, paradox. And I say that because I had the opportunity to access, to go down a shelter which is not open to the public and it doesn't have electricity, it doesn't have anything. I went down with a lamp uh, through a sewage hole and I found um, um, wet galleries, corridors with compacted uh, earth, um, noises, noises coming from the metro station, and I felt it was a, a new space that I couldn't control, a very different space. And for me, it was really a, a tipping point in the understanding of shelter. So I think it's really sad that we can not um, make all these shelters open to the public, but I understand that they are um, not safe spaces for citizens. If I can add something, uh, of course, when, when in, in papers, in, in newspapers, uh, uh, there's something which appears that we, we just discovered a shelter or something like that, lots of people want to see this, this shelter, but most of them want to see only by curiosity. It's very rare when people want to see because they have some historic interest. Generally, it's just curiosity because it's underground and uh, uh, it's there are lots of people who want to, to, to visit shelters but by curiosity, but there are only few official opportunities. Let's um, open up the floor to our audience. Yeah, does it work? You've been talking about uh, shelters not being safe places. I don't agree with you. There are shelters that, yes, it's, they are not safe, but others, you go down and uh, they seem robust and safe. And I would say that those people who use the shelters, not the visitors, but the ones who use the shelters, and well, there are witnesses, and I remember someone from Poplano, uh, an old lady that spent the whole war not sleeping at her place, but in a shelter with her grandchildren. The parents were not there because she felt safer in the shelter. So here it's the, the opposite experience. So the experiences in shelters were very different and concerning bombings too. Some people didn't want to go into shelters when there was a bombing. And concerning the use we, we can give to shelters, it's obvious that we cannot open up all shelters to the public because when I've been in shelters, uh, well, they, they are different. I think in 2006, I went down many shelters and uh, now I could also access some of these shelters with the help of the Catalan police. Why? Because many of these shelters had lost oxygen. In 2006, we, I could go down there, they, they had enough oxygen, but not now. I find, and I'm not an architect, that many shelters are very well built, done, and others, they look like a hole. 
we cannot open all shelters to the public, but here we have representative from Granulés, I think. In Granulés, uh, they have a good experience. Uh, um, they have marked on the ground where bombings took place. And uh, this is very clever, because we can talk about many bombings in Barcelona. We can organize uh, exhibits and publish books, and we've done it. Done it. But the fact that a, a girl, a boy, walks in the city and see marks where bomb, uh, bombings took place with uh, tiles on the floor, I think it's fantastic. Uh, if we can put a signal where a shelter uh, was, I think that um, would help. And I remember and uh, remember the shelter in Valencia Street here in Barcelona or in Tetuana Square, which is quite destroyed. But there are very impressive shelters. In the case of Paris, very few are open. But that uh, shelter has become the Liberation Museum. For me, it's a very powerful metaphor that uh, the, the model of a uh, shelter um, and uh, Roy Tanguy was there. I think that the, the shelter is now a museum. It's For me, it's very good. And Berlin, that can be used as a way to explain the history of Germany. It's fantastic. I think that some shelters could find a use like that or not related to history. Uh, the shelter in San Adria in uh, a square is an air raid shelter managed by uh, the district associations which is used uh, to have uh, just concerts on Friday and uh, neighborhood activities and, and it really has a, a use. I think that we could imagine uses for some of these shelters and uh, mark them all. And in some cases, we could say, well, if if we don't give a use for this space, we sh what should we do? What happens when we talk about uh, shelters? When uh, the sewage was done here. Uh, when Barcelona was uh, developed, they, uh, when they injected uh, cement in the city, um, well, they had to inject, inject cement in the city of Barcelona because there were all these holes that were shelters. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, what should we do? Because we have also all these holes in the city of Barcelona. We can give these shelters a use or then maybe we should reflect on what to do with all this. Thank you very much. Um, you, so you mentioned at the end the pub, public interest, in the curiosity of being underground. I think there is a very rich tradition in European folklore of the imagination of the underground, the underworld. And I'm wondering, is this something we are seeing now in the heritage presentation, in the public interpretation of air raid shelters? Are we seeing uh, urban legends, folklore emerging? That that would be a, this is something I am starting to, to see a bit in my work. I wondered if the speakers have any reflection on this. F contemporary folklore of the shelters. Everything that is underground uh, um, can uh, create urban legends. This happens here. 
and the work of specialists, archaeologists, architects, historians is a little bit to, to, to show the story. There is a subjective part, but the shelter is this is objective. I think that we have to say that there is not only one context or framework, but several. I agree with Xavier. We could give a shelter a different use, but, but explaining the story. I think that the um, Winston Churchill shelter in London is a very good example. It can be visited. And there is the whole interpretation of the UK with uh, the figures. And it gives a very clear idea of the life at that time. Heritage, not just shelter, um, must be given new uses. And when we educate, when we talk to the students, and I don't know what happens in France, in Germany, or in the UK, but here, unfortunately, heritage, it's not something uh, the population knows well, particularly young people. So I think it's important to educate, to disseminate information, and the specialists maybe haven't explained enough. And I think we have to do it in order to put an end to all these ghosts or urban legends. So we have to explain the reality, even if there is not just one reality, and so that people can understand from where we come, where we go, and the, to value the heritage we have, um, because it's important from a historical archaeological, archaeological point of view. I think this is the way forward, and we need the authorities, uh, as Jordi Wache was saying at the beginning, we need the authorities to work on democratic memory. We see that in the Balearic Islands have been working uh, with uh, mass graves, and we're not going to talk about this here, but it's it's also very important, and I think that the authorities here should um, deal with uh, shelters. Is not that people come because of any academical question of memory or history uh, or, or heritage or so. They are interested in history, and they want to see that. And it's not uh, any kind of curiosity of the bunker, but it's clearly expression of they want to know the history, what happened at that time. Hello. It was uh, for Thomas uh, concerning Paris, the case of Paris. You have said that the concept of passive defense has, uh, um, in France, uh, we were talking about civil defense, but all the, in your presentation, it was written uh, passive defense. So I don't understand if this change took place during the Second World War or is a result of ulterior representations or interpretations. And another question, referring to some documents that you show us concerning passive defense, are they from the beginning of the Second World War or from before the Second World War? And the example of Barcelona. So uh, I, I, I I, I know that I prefer to, to say civil defense than passive defense because it's the reason why French historians refuse to, to study this, uh, this, this part of the Second World War because it's not a, a fight uh, that we, we, we win or we lose. It's, it's just a defense and we, we stay passive, so it's not glorious. It's the reason why French historians refuse to, to study this. It's the reason why I, I prefer to say yeah, I, I prefer to say civil defense, like in English. And in English, people, in, in England, people people used to, to study the civil defense for s such a long time. Uh, in France, we just discovered this. And about the, the, the civil defense, yeah, of course, uh, during the First World War, we organized uh, the use of the metro station uh, by what by uh, the government, but it's not, it was not named the civil defense, but it's the organization which uh, the, the 
precursor of the, the civil defense of the Second World War. Yes. Um, I, I would like to talk about this very much, what you were talking. Uh, the problem I've, I found, I went to, I am anthropologist and also I work with uh, archaeologists and different uh, groups of research. And the big problem I found in every, every Congress that many times you go, you explain whatever, and many people is there that is no, not related with any academic or maybe just by chance. Then after, they start to look for your work, just like this, not like in Twitter or on email, whatever. Then they, you don't know exactly what is their, their intention, <laughs> you know? For example, I, I will explain to you. For example, uh, you go to Sweden, I went to Sweden, I went to, uh, how is this, uh, Czechia, no? And at the end, some people asking, ah, but where is this, this place? Where, where, where is the refugee? What is what you're talking about? Where? But in one way, that is not really for, you, you, uh, like uh, for show, for museistic things, or for some democratic uh, memorial. Yes, for other things. Then it's quite dangerous, because sometimes, how as uh, Carmen Miro was saying, not everything can be like museistic, uh, like, because it's very, very, very delicate. No? It's not like uh, uh, everyone is happy to have these refugees open, yes, for like, like uh, years, no? We need to be careful because we're not voyeurs. We are in one, everyone living in a story. We already are in one jail, already. That means that it's like very delicate topic about these refugees, about the, um, how you say, objectives, objective, uh, objectives are, it's, it's very good, but also there are feelings inside. Many people is there with their stories, not like he was saying in the jail, he was saying about the, not people, oh, you were saying also, when I forget the name, sorry. But the, you were talking uh, all the time also about people that wants to be in the refugee just yes, because they feel safe. And what about that? No? That they are buildings, uh, every day you can find in, in Barcelona, new buildings. Then you go, you cross, no, I'm not talking about uh, just one day. You cross the, the road after, disappear totally, in one day. One big building, disappear in one day, absolutely. Then you start to feel like one kind of Alzheimer yourself, because you say, what's happened with this? Being huge build, building, yet not, nothing is there, nothing at all. No, not the, not the, fabri the fabrics, nothing, they, nothing left. That is okay to put in the, in the floor, no? Reminding this, but not only in the floor, we need to, to take something and say, here was there, the situation, and happened this. Not only like, a, like one thing like, a, ah, okay, new building. Otherwise, we look like he was saying lower. He was talking about this, uh, no? Appear like a, one angel, suddenly, ah, the apocalypse and the other thing. No. Need to be very careful about what is happening with the refugees. 1,322, uh, it's a lot, a lot. But we cannot open, I long ago, long ago I was in, uh, in Gracia living in Gracia, I asked for going to the refugee. I don't know who was managing that time. They said no place for anyone, no place. I, we went to the place, uh, many people was going. I said, why they, they, they say refuse to me that not going there inside, why? Who was, who was there? And even I, I wrote email, I wrote many things, they don't no want to allow some people. Some people don't know, know. That is very, very, very delicate thing. Uh, the, the curiosity of, uh, for, for the people, um, our experiences, um, I'm working for the Berlin Underworld where we're making tours in Bankers, uh, we'll talk about tomorrow, um, but one main, main theme is that many people come to us and ask us, uh, is this Hitler's bunker? Was this Hitler? Was Hitler here? That, I guess, Wieland, you, you experience nearly the same, um, and you give them at least an example, and for our job is to, to take the people on the curiosity and then to yeah, to bring them back to the times and yeah, at least try to give them an expense and then an example of what have been and uh, yeah, bring them to the facts.
take their curiosity and hopefully bring them to knowledge. That's the, the job we try to do. Um, so I don't think it's bad that the people are curious about underground, underworld, which even have the myth of that that goes back to the Greek antiques. Uh, so we just take that and use that to, uh, to, to spread the knowledge. Okay, that's just my few points on here. I will continue passing the floor. As Chavi said, I think we need to use this question of what to do with shelters. And we need a center for the interpretation of the civil war. We need to connect these two. After so many years, a city as Barcelona or a country as Spain or a country as Catalonia, whatever you want to call it, we do not yet have a center that really explains what the civil war was. So the shelter, which was a defense uh, mechanism of the losers of that war, it will be very difficult to explain if we do not explain the international context and our own context of our own war. If we do not explain all of that, we will be able to show very specific structures and we will be able to talk about how dangerous or not is to access them. But what we need to do once and for all, and for example, the Montjuic Castle was a big opportunity to do that, that we missed. What we need to do is to explain the civil war, the international war that, that started here, and we need to link all of that together. Otherwise, we may be creating structures that, well, either we do a temporary exhibit, we're always doing temporary exhibits, but I think once and for all, we have to stop creating temporary exhibits, spending a lot of money on exhibits that last for a specific period of time, and they are very nice, but if they're not used subsequently, and if we do not consolidate those exhibits, well, when someone comes to Barcelona and says, for example, we have the Catalan History Museum, yes, but it's uh, too general a museum. And what we need is to explain, and for example, when our colleague from Berlin uh, tells us uh, that they talk about the pre-war, the race of Nazism, the Second World War, and subsequent times. I am jealous. And I guess what well, people in Paris also talk about the resistance. So we need to explain this international context, and especially the national context, and, and create this link with the shelters. Thank you. Yes, hello. Josep Maria Contel, I am head or I lead the Plaza del Diamant Shelter in Gracia. And I felt called that by this, this, this lady. And I would like to say that shelters always group together friends and enemies to take shelter from the bombs, because bombs do not tell apart friends or enemies. And the Plaza del Diamant Shelter has always been open now and before. I will talk about it here. Many people come to the shelter. It's open. Everything is perfectly fine. We have tours in Catalan, Spanish, and English. I do not understand where this information came from, the information that it was closed. I would like to encourage this lady to come and talk to me in private later to talk about that later amongst yourselves. And if there are any final comments from the panel, Otherwise, thank you. Thank you all very much. And thank you to the speakers. Thank you.